Welcome to City Cinema Tech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, we begin a five-week celebration of 100 years of Chinese cinema. Today's film hails from Shanghai and comes from 1937. It's called Crossroads, and we think this is the first time it's ever been shown on American television. The story is familiar. It's the quest of a set of young people who are recently out of school to find their place in the big city. In this case, the big city is Shanghai, and you're going to see some location shooting from 1937 in Shanghai. Overall, it's an absolutely fascinating piece of filmmaking. Joining us after today's screening to talk about it is Professor Ying Chu from the College of Staten Island, an expert on Chinese cinema. Now, enjoy the visual pleasures of looking at China in 1937 in Crossroads. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to see Crossroads, a film that, as I said earlier, we think is its American television premiere, because certainly these films from China in the 30s and the 40s have not been available until very, very recently. Happily today, however, we have someone who is available to chat about this. Um, uh, one of my colleagues from CUNY, uh, Professor Ying Chu from the College of Staten Island. Uh, as a scholar, she specializes in the Chinese film and television uh, industries. Uh, she's the author of Chinese cinema during the era of reform, the ingenuity of the uh, system. Uh, and is uh, currently working on a volume about a volume of essays with another scholar about uh, the Chinese uh, television industry. Welcome to City Cinema Tech, Ying. Glad to be here. Uh, let's start with this whole notion of what the Chinese film industry and the Chinese film culture is in 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 1937. What movies are playing in a city like Shang Shanghai? Is it Chinese movies? Is it what? What is it, and what's the state of the development of the industry? Well, um, this is during the Sino-Japan War period. It's the very beginning of the Sino-Japan War. Um, well, as we know, uh, Hollywood film was very, very popular in China during the time, and, and I'm sure uh, the majority of the theaters are, are, are playing Hollywood films. And, but on the other hand, we do have our own entertainment films and a variety of other films. And actually, I wanted to... Uh, sort of uh, backtrack, go back to okay. the early period of, uh, of uh, the time. Um, the, f the, uh, the studio who produced uh, Crossroads is called Star, the Mingxing uh, Film Company, okay. which is one of the uh, um, earliest, most venerable, uh, most established film uh, studio. It was founded in 1922 uh, by Zhen Zhenqiu, and Zhang Shichuan, and both are veteran Chinese filmmakers. And it's interesting, what's interesting is that both of them had their uh, cinematic apprenticeship in the Asia Film Company. Okay. The first uh, film company in China uh, established by the American merchant, uh, Benjamin Bransky. Huh. And this two guy um, had a very interesting relationship, Zhen Zhenqiu and the both founders of Star. Um, one of them, Zhen Zhenqiu, is, uh, is a theater critic and also is you know, very much invested in theater productions and so on and so forth. So he is interested in making pedagogical films. Okay. And well, as, uh, Zhang Shichuan is both a businessman and showman, so he's interested in making films that has entertainment value, commercial value, that will bring money. And as a result, um, Ming Xing and is famous for making films that has both commercial value and popular uh, appeal oh, okay. as well. And Ming Xing made a lot of the popular melodramas during a time. A lot of them are knockoff of the Hollywood uh, melodramas. Um, now I want to talk about uh, the film director, Sun yeah, Xiling. Who, who is Because we don't know. Right. Sun Xiling is one of the uh, very well-known left-wing filmmakers during a time. The left-wing filmmakers refers to a group of filmmakers uh, of the 1930s who, um, who were highly critical of the then nationalist regime 
the okay. Chiang Kai-shek regime in China, and they made film really expose the dark side of society okay. and, and wanting to change, um, trying to uh, get some sort of revolutionary spirit into their films. And Sun Xiling being one of the uh, left-wing filmmakers um, who was like a, uh, his uh, contemporary, very highly critical of the, uh, of the regime. And he made in the uh, 1930s three film classics, The Homesickness and Bold Man and Crossroads. And okay. Crossroads became one of, really is the pinnacle of his career and was highly influential during the time. Right. Okay, so th this is a very interesting um, moment, uh, 19, 1937. Uh, let's talk, uh, let, let's get into the, 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 the film it, it itself. Uh, first of all, I think this film can, is very familiar to us, in, it, but at the same time that it's unfamiliar. There's a kind of tug a pull and push and pull in the film between uh, something that we can relate to American or German or French urban cinema of the nineteen of, of the nineteen thirties. I think of something like William Wyler's um, Dead End, <laughs> uh, or I think of something like Marcel Carnet's uh, Daybreak, Le Jour Le Jour mm -hmm. uh, in which you know we're getting these descriptions of urban environments, right. but yet. You know, this is this is Shanghai. This is not Paris, and this is this is not. So, uh, what about this relationship to the um, to Hollywood cinema? What do you make of that in this film? Right, Hollywood cinema was very very influential uh, during the time, and one of the striking things about early Chinese cinema is really um, the extent to which Hollywood served as a conscious, very very conscious model for uh, Shanghai filmmakers um, oh. during that time. And the admiration for uh, efficient American films ran really, really high among the filmmakers. Um, most of the Chinese films of the 1930s really fit into the familiar genres to the West. That's why okay. you start to make references and so on and so forth. Um, this film, in, in particular, um, I'll talk about so I talk about the, the, the content in the film. Right. Remember the dream sequence? Oh, yes. It, it, yeah, she looks down, she sees the book Camille, and then she goes into the dream, uh, dream sequence. Right. Well, I, I must say what, what I thought about is uh, as I was uh, looking at the film uh, when I first saw it, I then and went and checked the dates because it struck me that the visual reference to George Cukor's uh, Greta Garbo, star vehicle, Camille, right. was obvious and that not only do we have a protagonist at that moment who's envisioning her urban life through a European model, mm -hmm. but it seems like she's specifically envisioning it through a Hollywood movie, you uh -huh. know. Uh, uh -huh. uh, it seems to be that there's a direct reference uh, to that and she gets to play Greta Garbo. Right. Uh, and you know her, her 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 potential paramour gets to play the Robert Taylor role. Oh, yes. Yeah. This interesting fantasy about this courtship, and we we'll talk about um, we were just chatting earlier. With yeah. <laughs> about the possibility of maybe the filmmakers or his film crew is actually seeing the 1936. Absolutely movie. the case. Right. And it's, it's also the, the sort of fantasy you know where she dons a Western dress and being courted by a. a a Western style noble man is very indicative, actually, uh, the saturation of Western culture in China during that time. Well, that's actually, I, I think you're onto a very interesting point when coming back to this push and pull, because one of the things that's so fascinating to me about the mise en scene, I mean, the setting mm -hmm. of the film, is that without anybody talking about Westernization, there's th th that you know that word or or other words that could be mm -hmm. used to talk mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's never talked about. We can see that tension uh, in the film because all the young people are clearly modeling their lives on Western mm -hmm. urban lives. Mm -hmm. Yet they're in a city that has skyscrapers, modern modern apartments. Uh, but that's not the neighborhood they're living in. Right. They're living in, a, in in traditional Chinese urban right. neighborhood. All right. Well, that's, yeah, this is one of the things that's striking about this film. It really depicts uh, a working class 
uh, living right. space. And the working class that embodies in this film actually is precisely is exactly the, the, the space that filmmakers themselves occupy. <laughs> they live, a lot of filmmakers, they, I think they earn $100 I mean, Chinese yuan right, yeah. a month. And this amount of money can hardly uh, pay the rent. Right. So they end up living in one of those garret, right. those, um, the, the Chinese called uh, ting zi jian. Um, because of that, it's interesting because a lot of people, a few filmmakers are actually sharing one little tiny ting zi jian. And so subsequently, the, some, some sort of uh, semi-bohemian style ting zi jian culture was developed. Oh, where okay. in, where in the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the comrades shared very poor, yet, very highly spirited, you know, living, collective living. Well, we, we certainly know something like that, certainly from the, uh, I mean, a city like New York, which has many similar characteristics to a city like Shanghai, has, this, has the same thing. A, you know, uh, X number of years ago, it's the village because it's chief. Then it becomes Soho. Then it becomes Tribeca. Right. Then it becomes a Williamsburg. Then it becomes et cetera, et cetera. These neighborhoods where young people of, of some aspiration socially or or artistically mm -hmm. uh, gather, create a kind of bohemia um, uh, out of, well, in this interaction between their aspirations and the working class that is indigenous to that, right. uh, in, in, to that neighborhood. Yeah. Yes, and Ting Zijian actually become, I think, uh, at the very early stage of film club right. during the time. And I wanted to sort of quote um, a little bit, a little passage from the director's oh, notes okay. talk about the, actually the harsh living condition for filmmakers in, in China. Also, the uh, the film, the physical condition of filmmaking in China. Uh, okay. This was a set. In Chinese cinema, there is neither adequate equipment nor sufficient capital. And the entire condition of filmmaking has reached a state of utmost poverty. Music and dialogue cannot be synchronized with each other. To record the sound of a shot, you cannot but put several cotton quilts to muffle the sound of the recording machine. You can certainly tell right. by looking at this film. Right. Um, right. Well, this is very interesting because what you're t this comes back to this subject of the Hollywood model. So what you've got is you've got a stylistic model that's being adapted, mm -hmm. but you but you don't have the same method of production. You're having to produce the same style, uh -huh. I mean, or, or at least something analogous mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. it, but out of completely different production conditions, because certainly by 1937, something like MGM, the yes. largest of the studios, is nothing if not a giant industrial empire mm -hmm. about as well oiled as any mm -hmm. machine mm -hmm. can, uh, can, can be. And what do you have here? Essentially, you have guerrilla filmmaking. You have yes. a company that exists far more on paper mm -hmm. uh, as a corporation than it exists as a filmmaking um, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, you know, the model it's going to imitate is that massive infrastructure yeah, of, the, the of, of Hollywood. Studio model at this very impoverished condition. And, right. Yeah, it's such interesting. Um, I also want to mention uh, the, the issue of a censorship. You know, realizing when you watch this film, uh, there isn't real direct hint about the war that's going on during the time. The right. Well, in family. fact, somebody who doesn't know of right. that war, if Probably you're not wouldn't. thinking about it, there's no way you would, by watching this film, know that there was a war going on in China at this yes, time. Yes, yes. Um, the, the film censor during the time uh, was very careful not to offend yeah. Um, the aggressors, so to speak. And so they actually cut out uh, quite a scenes from this film, okay. including uh, the lyrics to the, uh, to the theme song oh, that okay. chanted their aspiration for uh, reclaim the lost territory in right. Northeast China. Um, I wanted to sort of recite another passage by the director sure. related sure, sure. to the censorship. Uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, please do. <laughs> and quote, he said, in this treaty part, in Shanghai Treaty Park, we cannot uh, utter a single word about recovering the lost territory. We cannot hang a map of Northeast, and we cannot go on. We can only swallow our tears. That's in his director's notes. Wow. It's quite, quite interesting. 
And, and as a result of censorship, no direct reference whatsoever to the Japanese occupation was made in the final version of the film. This incident actually reminds me of a contemporary film uh, made by Jiang Wen called The Devil's at Doorstep. Mm -hmm. And the film was, you know, tackled the same uh, period during right. the uh, Sino Japan War. Um, the director, the film won uh, quite a few awards uh, in the West, but it's still censored in China because the film managed to offend both the right wingers in, in, in the Japanese uh, <laughs> government and the Chinese government, who is eager to sort of smooth out the wounds. And yeah, well, the, no, no, this is very interesting because now you're talking about. Uh, uh, essentially a tradition of censorship and self-censorship, yes. a, a combination of the two that stretches between China and Japan in dealing with this long and because it is a 14-year war uh, and long and brutal Asian war that, that, that to this day in a certain sense cannot be depicted with, with candor. Yes. Okay. It's the entire topic. Well, <laughs> the topic for another well, thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we'll, we'll 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 do that as another series. Some yes. <laughs> some sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's talk about uh, the the film uh, it, it, itself right. some more. And for example, these uh, these these characters and the performance style in the film. What do you make of a performance in the film? Um, both. The leading men, the leading lady, leading men, Zhao Dan, the leading lady, Bai Yang, are first generation, really the first generation film stars. Okay. And they're stars. And Bai Yang, and this film is actually Bai Yang's debut film. And as you can see, you know, to the contemporary eyes, her performance is overly exaggerated. Right. Very, very melodramatic and overly theatrical. But this is actually uh, shows the uh, theatrical undertone of Chinese cinema. Right. Coming from the shadow play and so on, heavily influenced by stage drama. And so that is actually the pretty standard performance style during the time. Okay. So uh, Bai Yang was very well received. Right. So it's, it's an interesting thing. To, let me come back to the contrast, and comparison contrast mm -hmm. I was setting up earlier. Because if you think of urban films like Weiler's Dead End or Carnet's mm -hmm. Le Jour Célève, you know, there is an a enormous subtlety in the cinematic acting. That is, the, what, what we consider to be you know, by our set of standards, the understated cinematic sure. acting mm -hmm. in which the camera is is allowed uh, to focus on a character mm -hmm. and subtle things, I mean, just a, a close-up, whatever, uh, reveals emotional states, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, as opposed to the camera being settled a bit further back, there not being as many cuts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the camera being there to capture theatrical gesture uh, and it may be even suppressed from from full theatrical gesture, mm -hmm. but to but to to capture all of that as opposed to you know the, li literally the movement of an eyebrow right. or a smile mm -hmm. or, or something uh, of that sort. So we we see and we can we can sense sure. uh, yeah. that um, uh, that difference. Yeah, that is a very very good point. It also probably has something to do with the uh, the, the poor production condition as well, the mobility of of the, of the camera. Right and, right. The, and the, uh, the, uh, the recording equipment and so on and so forth. A lot of times you feel like there's two uh, actors and uh, actor and actresses are really on stage performing. Right. The camera stand back and just <laughs> really, literally film the stage and performance. Well, a a a absolutely the case. A and uh, that's, that's sort of made, uh, in a certain sense, conspicuous because there are stretches of the film in which certainly by today's hyperkinetic standards mm -hmm. you're saying i need another angle i need some more That's cuts right. <laughs> i need some more uh, i need right. some more cuts here mm -hmm. and part of that is production conditions but also part of it is simply a slower pace mm -hmm. but you also have moments in which the director is trying to do that he's he really does dynamize the theatrical space mm -hmm. at, at at certain times there's also of course the the this whole um, uh, how shall i put it tension between those sh those scenes that are clearly in the most modest of studio mm -hmm. conditions, mm -hmm. truly modest, mm -hmm. uh, and those that are out on the street uh, in, in, in Shanghai. And mm -hmm. I think certainly to a Western audience, uh, these shots in which we really get some kind of sense of the space of Shanghai and the characters' interaction with mm -hmm. it, also the, the glamorized shots of the, 
of the uh, of the waterfront, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, etc., are, are you know they're a real peak. I mean, they're real. They're a real rev revelation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as well as from the filmmaker's point of view, being both an appeal to the audience, a, a Shanghai's audience, but Chinese audience. Look, right. here's our place. Here's right. our mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. um, but but also. To, to the world, insofar as a film like this had had you know was able to go into the Chinese diaspora, mm -hmm. you you get those uh, those um, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way. You get those travel log shots that 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 cinema does. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it exports architecture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, sure. it exports space mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 time. Mm -hmm. Well, what about these these characters in the film? I mean. What's the importance of them, and how do they fit in with the uh, overall uh, left-wing ideology of mm -hmm. the film? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, no, the story really, really depicts the tension between the youthful, happy-go-lucky psychology. They okay. fresh out of the college, and even though they don't have a job or have a job, not a decent job, they still they think you know they can get by. And so there's a crush between this kind of psychology and the very harsh reality during right. the time. Um, the living condition in Shanghai was very harsh, particularly to uh, the working class people. And what's interesting is um, now the, the director was able to carry uh, these sort of uh, the tension, depicting mm -hmm. the tension, carry this tension by this very interesting narrative structure the, right. the comedy and tragedy kind of um, structure. And the tragic comic uh, sections are really juxtapos juxtaposed to each other, right. um, actually without real transaction. You notice that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. And, 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 and I, I must say, when, once you see the overall shape of the film, mm -hmm. you can see that it's a matter of design, I mean th 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 that. But uh, for a first-time viewing of the film, right. it is uh, a bit unsettling um, because you say, "Well, wait a minute. H have they found the tone uh -huh. that they're th th that they're working w working with here?" Whereas right. th I, I right. think you put it so well. Part of the uh, the structure of the story is is actually. Uh, to portray the tension between these two things. Right, and tragedy and comedy. And I think it, actually this kind of uh, seem improvisation or sort of transition is quite emblematic of the sort of popular narratives, episodic construction that favors tonal uh, rupture, okay. or rather they don't pay attention to the sort of rupture. Um, you know, comedy, vulgar or refined, um, can be slapped alongside um, the pathos. Right. It was sort of popular uh, in Hong Kong film as well. Right. It was certainly. I mean, to this day. I mean, yes, yeah, some uh, martial arts film as well. Uh, abso absolutely, absolutely the case right. that you know we have some incredibly kinetic action sequence that we're supposed to enjoy, followed by you know a, a very sentimental. Uh, scene over a blind young woman or and the music a fallen swells. comrade. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, right, and and the film was able to achieve certain kind of uh, a synthesis yeah. at the end, um, as the the youth confronts, you know, the decide to, to right. will confront the, the harsh reality with our collective dedication or uh, just keep our spirit up, and so this is, you know, don't you think? Do you feel like a little? Uh, the, 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 the climax at the climax they you know both uh, people they lost a job right and we, we it seems that we are going towards a tragic ending but all of a sudden we have an upbeat um, padded open but resolution upbeat. yes yeah. open yeah, but upbeat yeah absolutely absolutely the case and then then they're marching I mean literally <laughs> marching the four of them arm in arm you know into uh, I I into the future. Now, wh how, to what degree is that, you know, characteristic of this s overall style of filmmaking that you, you need to end on the positive note? It's not exactly a Hollywood ending because mm. it's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a it, it's, it's a happy ending of a, it's a positive ending, but it's not with the, the it's not with the resolution mm. of the heterosexual romance and the, right. um, uh, and the professional, um, problems solved. Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. That stuff's open, yet we've got this, you know, shift of tone to the positive right. and the upbeat. Well, that's that's a very, very good point. It's a very interesting um, issue. Um, 
the, there is a so-called bright tail technique in Chinese cinema, particularly uh, the cinemas made in the 1930s. Um, well, clearly, so the, the literal meaning of bright tail is something that's uh, abruptly added at the very tail end. Okay. It's a happy ending. Um, well, given uh, the saturation of Hollywood influence during the time, audiences general, Chinese audience generally welcome happy ending right. after tragic events. And also the censorship, you know, the filmmaker has also to deal with the censorship, right. wherein they're not allowed to give a clear articulation of what we wanted, what they wanted to say, which is a revolutionary right. <laughs> theme. <laughs> right. They want to have a revolution, they want to change the regime, so on and so forth. So this, uh, so the only technique left to them really is to use apply the blight ending, okay. where they indicate things will change okay. if you make a difference. If you if the radical revolution is to take place, it's hinted, you know, right. not directly stated, but it's hinted. Okay, well, you know, we're going to have to wait for the revolution to come in next <laughs> next still week's waiting for <laughs> <laughs> because we've run out of, of of time this time around for for this episode. If you'd like more information about this series on 100 Years of Chinese Cinema, on other things at uh, CUNY TV, well, it should be no surprise that the way to get that information is from our website. Please visit www.cuny.tv. Again, that website is www.cuny.tv. Ying, 30 minutes is not much time to deal with all of Chinese filmmaking in the 1930s, but I think we made a, a good stab at it. Yes, I think th th Thank you for joining us here today, and our viewers will see you again uh, when you're going to be talking about the last film in mm -hmm. this particular uh, series, The Swordsman of Double Flagtown. Mm -hmm. So we'll um, see you. I'll be seeing you fairly soon when we uh, talk about that, but thanks for joining us today. Uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Great. And thank you for joining us, and I hope you continue to stroll through the archives of film history with us in the weeks to come. In any case, bye-bye for now. For information about the College of Staten Island CUNY Modern China Studies Certificate and related programs, please call 718-982-2315 or visit the website.